Hello everybody, welcome back to Alan Walls Photography. I am Alan and today I'm going to remedy a problem I caused more than once over the last few months. So here's the deal. I have done several videos uh, addressing macro equipment, macro gear. We've talked about uh, reversed enlarger lenses, and uh, we've also talked about all the various adapters that we use. Several people have got in touch with me through the channel to point out that I didn't give any examples of the kind of photographs that this equipment gets, and that's absolutely true, I didn't. It wasn't really an oversight because I was trying to focus just on the mechanics of putting all the pieces together. But in retrospect, and especially after reading all your comments, you're absolutely right. I should uh, definitely have included some uh, examples. And I'm going to remedy that problem right now. I'm not going to rehash what we've already talked about. Uh, though I am going to uh, make a few points I, I made before. Uh, to try and uh, explain a few important principles of doing macro photography. The most important of which is that the gear has relatively little to do with it uh, compared to spending the time preparing for your shoot and uh, knowing your camera and understanding the gear you are going to be using. You can get spectacular results with just about any of it. And I'm not only going to show you pictures that I'm proud of, I'm going to show you pictures that I'm definitely not proud of uh, to explain some of the specific problems you get into using some of this equipment. Every photograph in macro photography can conceivably be done in several different ways. And that's important to consider. For me, just because uh, it's, it's easier and more comfortable and I get consistently better results, when I'm out in the field, I shoot with a macro lens, pretty much always. Uh, I have various different lighting uh, setups that I use, uh, several different cameras, several different lenses. But the, uh, the convenience and the flexibility of a true macro lens out in the field is pretty hard to beat. Most of the time when I'm talking about using enlarger lenses and reversed lenses and composite lenses, different lenses hooked together, I'm talking about the kind of macro photography I do in the studio where I have more control over the environment and I'm shooting usually for much higher magnification than I'm going to be able to get in the field. So most of this stuff is going to be talking about that kind of macro photography, the stuff we do on the kitchen table or in the studio where we can add the lighting we need and really make sure that all of the, uh, all of the environment we're photographing in is, is right for what we're doing. Um, almost all of the images I'm going to show you today, at least until the very end of the episode, were shot on the cheapest, smallest DSLR that I have in my possession. And there's a reason for that. I wanted, and still do, want to encourage people to try macro photography. And to do so, I'm going to try to show you that you don't need expensive anything to do it. Uh, you can spend as much money as your heart desires on, on high quality macro stuff, but you really don't need it. And that is the reason that I go on and on about enlarger lenses. The very best enlarger lenses that you're, you're likely to run into, unless you have a fortune burning a hole in your pocket, are going to be the uh, L Nikkor uh, 50 millimeter enlarger lens that we talked about uh, in the in the last episode um, this is a fantastic filling 50 millimeter lens and uh, it's incredibly sharp it's incredibly reliable and it has a few other characteristics about it that your camera lenses don't being an enlarger lens it is designed uh, to operate as a flat field lens it's supposed to focus on a flat area so when we turn the thing backwards and stick it on our camera, it's ideally suited for, for uh, projecting 
a super sharp image onto our camera sensor. But the main reason I encourage people to look into uh, macro photography with these lenses is they're so cheap. Uh, you can get them for 25 bucks, maybe with a scratch or two on them or some dust inside, but it doesn't really seem to make much difference. Uh, but you can get one of these. You can probably get two of these for the price that you would pay for an absolute rock bottom, mostly plastic 50 millimeter lens. Having said that, this is one of the sharpest lenses that I own, and it's about a hundred bucks. So the real reason I encourage you to learn about the adapters and uh, the, the way that you can use inexpensive equipment and a few dollars worth of adapters to take good photographs uh, is because it's cheap and you can get in there without having to invest a fortune. We're gonna be talking about some more expensive stuff like using bellows. Because we talked about the bellows, I'm gonna show some example of that. But let's get into to some of the, the photographs. By the way, when we talk about cost, I sat down and thought about the cost this afternoon. For somebody who's interested in giving it a try, but doesn't want to spend any money. The cheapest way is just to take your 50 millimeter or your pancake lens, whatever came with your camera, and turn it backwards with a reversing ring and maybe one or two pieces of uh, an extension tube. That's dirt cheap. An extension tube set, maybe 10 or 20 bucks for the fancy ones. Um, the, next, uh, the, the next level up would be an enlarger lens with an extension tube, which is going to give you all the magnification you're probably ever going to want, plus super, super sharp images for very little money. The next step up from that, of course, is adding a bellows. And you don't have to get a Nikon bellows uh, there are a lot of third parties now making very, very good bellows. In fact, I'm looking at getting uh, a Novaflex, I think it's Novaflex, don't hold me to it, but that is a, a tilt bellows. It actually allows you to change the plane uh, of, the, uh, of the lens so that you can use it like a tilt shift lens, basically to get more of your, your field of view and focus. And then of course, up at the other end of the spectrum, the most expensive way to do it is to just go out and buy a macro lens. But presumably you want to see if you like it first. And that's that's why, you know, you watch the video on on the uh, adapters because you can get into that so cheaply. So let me show you what some of the pictures look like, the good, the bad and the ugly. In this, uh, this these first couple of pictures are uh, a damselfly. This is a, an old photograph that shows just about everything bad uh, about doing macro photography wrong. There's fringing and uh, diffraction and softening all over this, uh, this image. There seems to be a light leak as well, the light coming back into the camera, uh, from um, uh, probably from the way I had the lens mounted. But this is just an absolutely terrible picture to show you the starting point. And I have hundreds of these. I'll be happy to share with you as many of these awful pictures as I have. I keep them for this very reason, to, sh to show you that uh, it's not the equipment. Uh, it's, uh, it's how we learn how to use it. Uh, the, this is all, by the way, these first few images I'm going to show you are all using a regular 50 millimeter uh, cheap kit lens on a reversing ring uh, on your camera with or without a couple of pieces of extension tube. This next image is a scorpion tail. Uh, it's still not well lit, but it's fairly highly magnified considering that was shot with only about 30 millimeters of extension and a reversed uh, 50 millimeter lens, uh, but it came out quite good. Uh, the next image uh, is a green beetle that uh, has been with me a long time. I still have him. He's still in his jar. I found him dead in the park, and uh, I've been photographing him for years. I'll be showing you some more pictures of him later on. Uh, but this is a stacked image using the uh, uh, reverse 50 millimeter lens on an extension tube. Now, this image of a pill bug 
uh, is one that I used a longer extension tube on, but still just a reverse 50 millimeter lens. And I like this pick because I think it's much better lit. Um, and I, I think that um, uh, the, the stack was more accurate. I, I, for the longest time, I did all my stacking by hand. Which, which meant I was moving the camera and the lens towards the subject and trying to get accurate, tiny increments. And you can do that up to a point. Uh, I'll get into to more on, uh, on, on focus stacking uh, another time, but it is really difficult. And one of the problems that you may have using this inexpensive gear uh, is is getting really good focus stacks that don't have sections of the subject missed and out of focus. Um, and that is one of the, the real limitations uh, of using this kind of gear. But even with uh, a halfway decent focusing rail, the extension tubes and a reversed 50 will give you some awesome results. This is a stink bug and I used a, a long set of extension tubes for this. It's quite, quite highly magnified. And uh, one, of the, one of the issues that this setup of a reversed 50 and extension tubes is there's very little working distance. Your, your subject is gonna be right in front of the lens. And if you add, like uh, we talked about last time, if, if you add a, um, a BR3 adapter, and a, some kind of a protective UV filter to the front, your working distance gets even shorter. And a lot of these pictures show you uh, the, the lack of light and the lack of adequate lighting when you're using a system uh, like a full set of extension tubes and a reversed 50, where you have no room to light the subject really from the front. This is another photograph of the same stink bug, but in this case, I used a much shorter extension tube and a reversed 50 millimeter lens. Um, and I uh, tried a few different things. Actually, this was shot with continuous lighting uh, using a whole series of uh, small LEDs positioned around uh, the, the very front edge of the lens assembly. Uh, and it was able to give some, some pretty good results, but it's incredibly cumbersome and a lot of setup. One of the things we touched on briefly, but I didn't get into a lot of detail about, was uh, using a compound lens setup, setup where you have one telephoto lens. In this case, uh, this is a sweat bee that I photographed uh, with a 200 millimeter prime lens. Um, uh, faced in the normal direction and focused to infinity with a 50 millimeter uh, reversed lens in front of that. And to, to connect those, I used the uh, reversing uh, ring uh, uh, that I showed you last time. And this, this really uh, is a hard system to use. It's, it's difficult to get it well lit. It's difficult to get enough light in. And uh, by the time, by the time you get a hold of a 20 uh, of a 200 millimeter prime lens and a 50 millimeter put on the front of front of it you could have bought a um, uh, a macro lens so it's not something i i do a whole lot i've experimented with it and haven't found a lens combination that really gives me advantages over these other methods so the next thing is the uh, uh enlarger lens that we we talked about earlier now with a 50 millimeter enlarger lens, I talked a lot about, about mounting it reversed um, and mounting it forward. It doesn't really matter with a 50 millimeter enlarger lens, whether it's mounted forwards or backwards, except for a couple of things uh, that um, uh, will, will be problematic. The newer model has, an aperture window in the side. I think I showed this to you when we we're talking about enlarger lenses. There's a problem with this when it's mounted the way it was intended. When it's mounted like this on extension tubes or on the camera, light can leak into this lens, uh, especially if you're using uh, 
you know, flash of some intensity, the light can leak in through this window and it can really ruin your pictures. You can get uh, glare and ghosting from that. Uh, so that's one thing to think about. The other reason, even though you don't have to reverse an enlarger lens, when you do, when you do mount it backwards instead of forwards, you have a lot more room to light your subject. When it's the way it's supposed to be, you're really blocking off a lot of your subject from getting uh, light onto it. So. I prefer to, uh, to, to use it backwards, even though it doesn't offer a clarity or magnification difference. Not the case with the 50. The 50 reversed actually is sharper when you're doing macro stacking uh, than the correct way around. And you get a little bit of magnification this way as well. So just thought I'd mention that. So here are some pictures. Um, that uh, are going to look at examples of the reverse 50 millimeter in larger lens and extension tubes. First of all, this is what the setup looks like. Um, there are many ways you can set this up. This is just one example of, of how I might put it together. And in this first set of images, uh, we have a paper wasp um, that um, Again, this was brought to me by uh, one of my neighbors and uh, it's in terrible shape. It's missing parts of its limbs and antennas. Um, I don't know uh, whether my neighbors killed it or they found it dead, but uh, it wasn't in very good shape. But I did use it to take some example shots of what you can do with a reversed in larger lens and some extension tubes. Uh, you'll see that we get a lot more detail and uh, because of the uh, the, the flat plane of the enlarger lens, we're able to, uh, it, it provided we can get accurate, well spaced out um, uh, segments in our focus stack, you can get some really very, very sharp images this way. It takes a lot of stacks. These uh, paper wasp stacks uh, were 70, 75, 100 uh, images deep. Uh, to get everything uh, in focus. Uh, let me see, the next one is, oh, this was a, a fun photograph uh, of a, uh, what's it called, a passery beetle, I believe. It's got three horns on it, and it's great to photograph from any angle, and I've taken hundreds of photographs of this beetle too. Uh, but uh, this is a focus stacked image, taking the picture from behind and above the beetle, so his you're, you're seeing his horns in an unusual um, uh, direction. And uh, that wasn't easy to do using uh, a reversed enlarger lens uh, and long extension tubes, again, because of the, the lighting issue. Uh, but it's certainly easier than trying to do the same thing on a 50 millimeter lens. You've got a lot more room. This last one is one of uh, several pictures of um, my uh, favorite housefly, another subject that I have sitting patiently in a jar waiting to be photographed again, uh, though he's uh, probably reaching the end of his useful life. But you can see that using the enlarger lens reversed and doing a, a careful stack, you can get some remarkably sharp images. I'm going to do an episode entirely on how to use Xerine Stacker. I've talked about it so many times. Uh, I think it's such an awesome program, uh, and I think the results are just tremendous. So I'll, I'll do that separately another time. But uh, this lens will give you the input for the stacker that will allow you to get the best possible output, in my opinion. The next step up, then, is the bellows. This is what a bellows setup might look like. Ignore the dust. This I set this up just to show you what it could look like, and uh, I, I didn't uh, dust it down the way I normally would. Uh, bellows are bad about dust. When you open the bellows up, it tends to suck in any dust, dust that's settled into the crevices of the device. So I always blow this off very carefully and then run the vacuum uh, over it as well before I expand the bellows so I'm not sucking uh, uh, dust into them. Because once you suck dust into them and you change the magnification of the bellows, 
by um, by expanding the bellows like so, you are sucking air and dust right into this cavity. And then if you try to change that again, you're going to pump it right back into your camera. So it's it's worth it's worth thinking about. So these pictures are some of the pictures I get. You'll you'll notice they're mostly higher magnification because you can get so much more magnification uh, with a bellows that extends all the way out to 200 millimeters. So uh, these are all using the enlarger lens. Um, I think there may be one on here that is not reversed. Uh, if uh, if I remember, I'll tell you which one that is. Uh, but uh, this is our sweat bee from earlier, but switching from the extension tubes to the bellows to get a little bit closer up. And again, I all the credit in photographs like this go to the focus stacking. Uh, the you have to put in sharp images, but if you do and you do a good job with the stacking, you can get out images of this quality with a twenty-five dollar lens. The next uh, five images are of the same grasshopper. Um, again, gifted to me. Uh, this was a wonderfully colorful um, lubber grasshopper from um, around these parts and um, it was a big grasshopper which allowed me to to get a tremendous amount of detail using the uh, uh, using the bellows and the uh, enlarger lens lighting was very important and I uh, switched to continuous lighting uh, to light this because it was it was so big and there were parts of the insect that I wanted to light differently than others. So I used some gels and some uh, LED, positionable LED lights uh, that uh, really gave me a lot of flexibility. But again, this was done with a very inexpensive, uh, enlarger lens on a fairly expensive set of bellows. So this is another view of uh, my house fly uh, and another view of the paper wasp that I showed you earlier. Again, both of these with uh, significantly higher magnification using the bellows. And this is a detail from the stink bug I showed you earlier, also just a result of extending the bellows. Now, if you're starting to think that these images uh, are all darker than, than what we've been looking at before. That is definitely one of the issues with a long set of bellows. Uh, when, you, um, when you extend the bellows to full length, you're reducing the amount of light that's getting to the sensor by a factor of four. So lighting becomes really critical. Generally speaking, by the way, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, I don't stop down real far on these, these lenses. I, I try to stick around five, six to eight, which is rather their sweet spot. And then, um, and then just take more images in the stack to compensate for the unbelievably shallow depth of field you're gonna get at 5.6 with the bellows fully extended. So as, as the extension on the bellows gets bigger, the magnification gets bigger, and the light gets harder to handle. This is a uh, butterfly antenna, just the very tip of the, the antenna of a, a, a fairly small butterfly. So to give you some idea of just how effective the bellows at full extension with a reversed enlarger lens can be, this is a, a little grub. Uh, that I found on my doorstep. The thing is tiny, it's thin, it's almost translucent. Uh, and uh, I photographed it on this ruler so you can see I'm not making it up. It's really, really small. And these two images, the first one is the head of the caterpillar. And there's a, just a tremendous amount of detail using this uh, magnification setup. And the, the photograph at the back of the caterpillar is even more amazing. You can see all the, the structure and the little hairs and the muscles that operate this little caterpillar's uh, legs or pseudopods or something. Anyway, the things that make it move at the back end, that's what those uh, stumps are. And that magnification is uh, pretty impressive. The 
Uh, Grasshopper here uh, was shot also on the bellows, but with a smaller uh, extension of the bellows, maybe about uh, 60 millimeters, which is about the same as a full set of extension tubes. So last summer I was visited by a narrow waisted wasp that uh, obviously didn't like my living accommodations, flew in through the window and uh, died. Uh, this is a really, really small wasp, and I had no idea it had blue eyes. Uh, you, there's no way the eyes were smaller than than the heads of pins. Uh, but this is this is that guy uh, in in various different positions, uh, photographed at full extension of the bellows with uh, the reversed enlarger lens, and. I haven't mentioned this, but when you're using this setup, the reversed enlarger on a fully extended bellows, this is where you really absolutely have to be photographing from a stable platform. And if if you have access to uh, a, a, a mechanized focus rail, uh, this is when you would need it because the uh, increments uh, that you're moving the uh, to, when you focus on something this small, you're moving the camera and the focus rail as a unit. It all moves as one closer and further from uh, your, your specimen. And each increment of movement is minuscule. It's very hard to do manually by turning the button because there's a little play in the buttons and it's often easy to overshoot or undershoot your 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 distance, and if you're off by a fraction of a fraction of a millimeter, you're gonna have a part of the image that's out of focus. So to get it fully in focus like this, I, I would usually recommend uh, either building or buying a mechanized focus rail. Um, we'll do a, an episode on that too, because that is a remarkable piece of equipment. Uh, fun to use, and it really opens up a lot of possibilities in much higher magnification, like if you're using microscope objectives, but we're not talking about that today. It's worth noting when we look at this image, which is the same exact wasp, but shot with a, a standard uh, 90 millimeter macro lens. It's a single shot with a very shut down aperture uh, and you'll notice that the, the quality of the image where it's in focus is really nice. Uh, but the focus drops off very quickly in the back, very quickly in the front, which is why the limbs are, are barely in focus at any point at all. And that's really important to remember when you're trying to select what method you're going to use for the photograph you want to take. that when you're out in the field and you're you're photographing bugs you have to use your compositional skills to make sure that uh, that you're getting the part of the insect you want in the right part of the, the frame and you're blurring out the parts that are of secondary importance and you need to be thinking about the composition about the background about any foreground elements. It's just like shooting a landscape when you're out there in the woods with a macro lens. The first three pictures of, of this narrow-waisted wasp have a very plain, nothing background because uh, with, with this type of image, you don't want a busy background. It makes stacking the image very much harder, it introduces a lot more artifact. Uh, and you can't stop down uh, nearly as far. So uh, here are a couple more images of the uh, detail of our fly, uh, just to show you how powerful the, the um, uh, reversed uh, enlarger lens can be. So the question always comes down to uh, when, when somebody's doing macro, they're loving it and they're thinking about investing in a macro lens, is it worth buying a macro lens? I have several macro lenses and uh, I love them all. They're all very good uh, and they all work beautifully. 
especially out in the field. I'm very happy with them. But when it comes to, to shooting high magnification in the studio, where I can control the light uh, and I can control the magnification, frankly, I prefer for focus stacking to use a reversed enlarger lens with a couple of adapters to fit it on the bellows. But I'm going into it knowing I'm going to stack the images. So I thought I'd show you a few focus stacked images taken using either my 85 millimeter f3.5 macro lens or my 90 millimeter f2.8. These were all stacked using large numbers of uh, images and using just the uh, macro uh, lens on a focus rail. The first one is my old friend, the Green Beetle, and uh, it's not a good photograph, but you can see that the quality is certainly uh, in, the, uh, in the ballpark of the reversed enlarger lens, but not quite as sharp, in my opinion. Uh, same with this image of uh, the wasp. This is another stacked image uh, that is no more pleasing than, uh, than, than the reversed enlarger lens. Of course, you have a lot more room to work with the, rever with the uh, uh, macro lens. Your working distance with a macro lens, even if it's on bellows, is going to be long compared to the working length on a, a reversed uh, enlarger lens. But the output, I think, is sharper going this way. If you can find ways to get around the mechanical limitations of trying to get enough light onto your subject when you have this on a fully extended bellows. And this is uh, an assassin bug that uh, required 120 images to stack this. It was a difficult shot too because the bugs are all the same color and partially translucent. It lives in tiny yellow flowers, goldenrod flowers, and hides under the leaves. And then when a, uh, a, um, a nectar searching pollinator lands on the floret, this thing comes up and grabs it with those big grabbers on the front and, uh, and eats it. So it's a, it's a small bug and it's difficult to shoot, but uh, this is a fairly good result for a stacked image using uh, a macro lens. Now, most of my macro photographs are single shot. They're taken in the field, sometimes with, sometimes without flash, usually with flash. I prefer to use a single speed light with a diffuser or a pair of small speed lights, uh, but I, I prefer having, having uh, light available to me because when you're taking single shot um, macro lens photographs, you, you really need to stop down a little bit to the point at which you're seeing some diffraction. Uh, otherwise, your depth of field is gonna be so shallow uh, that you're gonna lose part. You can't even photograph a compound eye at high magnification that has focus all the way through unless you're able to add a little light. You can use reflectors and other techniques as well, but I'm just telling you what I do. So these are a couple of long leg flies. They're really common around here. They're absolutely beautiful, uh, but you have to choose which part of the insect you're gonna have in focus when you're taking the pictures. Uh, because uh, again, even stop down, you're only gonna get part of it in focus. Uh, this is an ant, and, and this I put this in to remind me to remind you that uh, when you're using a macro lens and you're out in the field, whether you're adding light or not, it really, really helps to try to, to take photographs perpendicular to your bug. In this case, the ant is largely in focus because he's largely on a flat plane with the sensor of my camera. So positioning your shot so that you're uh, catching as much of the interest as you can in a single focal plane 
is an important trick to using a, a macro lens. You don't have to worry about that if you're using a, a, a stacked uh, setup where you're going to shoot 100 pictures anyway. So a photograph like this, this digger bee getting ready to eat a grub, would be just about impossible using focus stacking, bellows, reversed in larger lenses. You need all that stuff with you while you're out in the field because digger bees uh, eating grubs don't just stand still for you to take 100 photographs of them. So there is a real uh, dimension to macro photography that you're going to miss out on without a macro lens. So this last photograph is a, a true bug called a wheel bug. And I, I show this just to, uh, to, to give you an example of how a bug in the wild with a good macro lens and a steady hand and good lighting can be every bit as appealing and, and just about as detailed as a focus stacked image. But to recap very briefly, if you are in a controlled setting and you want to do high magnification uh, photography using focus stacking, you want your image to be sharp from front to back, I would recommend that you get your hands on a high quality six element uh, in larger lens. The cheaper plasticky four element lenses don't do nearly as well. So look for one of the ones I mentioned in the other video and I'll link that video here. But that is gonna serve you for the rest of your photography career. Invest in some bellows and you can increase the magnification greatly over your extension tubes. But if you're planning on doing most of your photography out in the wild, then at some point you're going to have to bite the bullet and um, and buy a macro lens. You can get you can get good macro lenses uh, for a reasonable price used, and some really good ones uh, are available in the two and three hundred dollar range. So uh, if if you're just getting started, I urge you to experiment with the stuff you've already got and uh, see how much you like it before you invest in the lens. Though, to be honest, a good macro lens is also a great portrait lens. Uh, I've, even, I've even done landscapes with, uh, uh, with my shorter uh, focal distance macro lenses. Well, that's about all I have for you. Thank you so much for watching. I hope uh, that this was useful and I suspect it taught you that it doesn't really matter what gear you uh, use so long as you use it right and get lots of practice and, and learn where the pitfalls are. Uh, if this was something that appealed to you, please consider joining the, uh, uh, the channel, subscribing, and, and hit the bell thing, and that way I'll let you know when a new video is out. Um, but uh, either way, uh, if, even if you don't want to subscribe, you're welcome back anytime. We've got some really cool, interesting stuff coming up. Thank you again to the people that um, uh, contacted me to tell me about remembering to put in um, examples. I really appreciate constructive criticism. It really does help. And uh, I'm doing this for you guys. So if I'm not doing it right, you need to tell me uh, and I will fix it. Uh, if you happen to be watching this when it was released, Happy New Year. Otherwise, well, you still have a Happy New Year whenever you're listening to this. What am I talking about? Happy New Year. <laughs> See you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.